We are joined by Specky favourite and regular columnist Michael De Percy. Michael, welcome to the show. It's great to be back, Alexandra. Look, Anzac Day is this week, and I have to say it's been pretty quiet. In years gone past, Anzac Day served as a rallying call to the left to come out of the woodwork and shout all sorts of anti-Australian and anti-colonial things. But now that Albanese is Prime Minister, it seems he doesn't really want to be embarrassed in front of his Anzac partners. And suddenly, Michael, like magic, the activist outrage has vanished. Are we in for a quiet and uninterrupted Anzac Day this year? I'm not sure that's the case just yet. I was reading a report on the way in that uh, apparently some of the Anzacs massacred Palestinians in the First World War, so, uh, and teachers are teaching this at school, which is, uh, you know, a bit of a late sort of run by the left, but uh, I'm not surprised at all. But look, I must admit, uh, even though there has been some criticism of the Prime Minister, I think it's really important for that position to honour the Anzac tradition and for our Prime Minister to be uh, in Papua New Guinea on the Kokoda track. Uh, it can only be a good thing, and at least he's starting to recognise the importance of our Anzac heritage. Well, Albanese has been adding to his gargantuan carbon footprint because, as you correctly say, he's been over in PNG strengthening tyres in the face of China's expansionism, which is kind of odd, Michael, given that Albanese's Labor government spends half of its time down on its knees worshipping the cult of Xi Jinping and the other half supporting the general narrative that China poses the biggest future threat to Pacific security, which actually happens to be true. But the hypocrisy makes a bit more sense when you read further into the article and see that Albanese is actually helping PNG with two giant solar farms. Now, the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific is handing over $229 million in Australian taxpayer money to PNG for these solar farms. And it's not something that regional Australians want to hear when they, you know, their towns have no water and no power and no sewerage. But I mean, it is of interest to the Albanese government. So, is there a, a worry that Albanese is using Anzac Day as a bit of a PR mission for net zero, or are we just going to take whatever we get given from Albanese as long as it's a quiet Anzac Day? I think there's an element of that. And like I said, I think it's important for the office of the Prime Minister to be doing these sorts of things. But of course, there is that attachment to government subsidisation of anything to do with solar or wind or any of these other intermittent uh, power sources. So, look, it, it is a real problem. And as you say, in the regions, the roads are just horrible. Um, the population growth, uh, particularly in regional New South Wales, is it, it's really starting to bite. And there are towns like Yass where you can barely drink the water, yet they're creating new subdivisions which are going to grow the size of the, the town and they just don't have the infrastructure to deal with it. And, you know, when we hear of money being spent overseas, particularly on solar, if this was something that was really shoring up our national security or our trade policy or something like that, uh, I think it would be much more justifiable. But it seems to be just more government subsidisation, but outside of Australia as well. Well, China wasn't very happy. China's foreign minister said, hilarious. Seriously, I might add, that Pacific countries are not the backyard of any nation. They say this while China debt traps its, uh, you know, corrupt and poorer neighbours and parks their warships in their harbours. But, Michael, I want to draw your attention to something Albanese said while he was in PNG, and I'm going to quote him now. Crucially, what gives us greater confidence in the better future is that we build on the strong foundations of our shared past. The legacy of those who fought for PNG and Australia eight decades ago surrounds us and warms us in, the, warms us in its embrace. Our free societies, our democracies, the very fact that we can gather here in peace and in friendship. Now, I'm sorry, but this is the Prime Minister who is preaching freedom and democracy while his e-safety commissioner has turned Australia into a global laughing stock. You know, we are ground zero for the fall of Western democracy. And uh, I don't see how this can be anything other than hypocrisy. Has he learnt the lessons of the previous war, Michael? Or is he just saying words and not really understanding what they mean? I, I think that's a bit more complex than that. And, and the reason I say that is... Uh, Mr Albanese is dealing with some major division within his party and that was brought to light by the ACTU's statement on Palestine this week. Uh, and so the, the extreme left, uh, the, the problem child, if you will, of the Labor Party is rearing its head. Now, of course, Mr Albanese is a product of, uh, of this, this group as well. So he's trying to sort of hold the ship of state together while dealing with these extreme views within Labor's left. So he's trying to play to uh, the regular regional Australians 
And look, we're just preparing for our Anzac Day in Gunning in regional New South Wales. We had over 300 people out of a population of 800 to 10 last year, and we're expecting even bigger this year. So, you know, the mood in regional Australia toward the Anzac tradition is very strong and growing. Uh, and, and so it's important that the Prime Minister maintains that, uh, that, that stance. But at the same time, we're not seeing the same stance for protecting our Liberal Democratic ally in the Middle East, which is Israel. Uh, we're not hearing much about uh, support for Korea as well, which is still on the frontiers of democracy, technically still at war with North Korea. Uh, so to be sort of drawing on those historical alliances in PNG, but uh, he's it, virtually uh, cherry-picking where he can use these sorts of words. And, and like I say, I think it's a bit more complex because he's got a real fight on his hands dealing with the, the internal division within his own party, the foreign minister's foreign policy changes that have been made on the step and which are out of step with uh, m m many Australians. So, look, yeah, a real fight on his hands and uh, I think he's just trying to get as much mileage as he can out of Anzac Day. Well, for me, he's very much of a flavour of the month, you know, Prime Minister, where he moves from one press conference and one uh, photo shoot to the next and then promptly forgets about what he was doing and then goes to the next person he wants to get a bit of traction with. But moving on, speaking of the fall of Western civilization, Michael, poor Richard Dawkins is back in the press speaking about the defence of scientific truth. Is he trying to protect some radical new scientific theory? No, he's trying to re-establish Biology 101 and that there are two sexes, male and female, and the two can never switch shells like hermit crabs. What did you make of the story in the world section, the specy this week? Do you feel a bit sorry for Dawkins? I actually do. I, look, I, I, don't, I don't agree with his atheistic stance. I mean, I'm not an atheist, end of story, but uh, at, the, at the same time, I think, you know, people can have their own views, their own opinions. That doesn't affect how we function in a, a liberal democracy. But it's really interesting that he's sort of now butting up against identity politics as being worse than religion. It's kind of the new religion. And to hear his sort of statements that to suggest that religion's probably better than what we're doing right now. Uh, but at the same time, it's interesting people like Dawkins who are able to speak more freely after retirement because of that threat of cancellation. Uh, and he's been sort of under that threat for at least the last 12 years, I think, particularly around uh, biology. But it, it's interesting too because uh, I was watching a, a meme about uh, gender and there was a Martian talking to people from Earth and suggesting that, well, what are the functions of these other genders and the people saying, but what do you mean? They don't have functions. And, and that sort of really aligns with Dawkins' argument. It's like, well, if these other genders or sexes exist, what are their functions? And there really aren't any. And it's clearly identity politics. Well, the additional genders are a bit like the humanities degrees at university. They don't really have any functions. They just exist for political purposes. But uh, Dawkins has fallen afoul of two sacred work topics, transgenderism and Islam. Now, I gained a lot of respect for Dawkins when I read about his 2013 comments where he said, and I quote, all the world's Muslims have fewer Nobel Prizes than Trinity College, Cambridge, end quote. He was making a point about how the repressive ideology of Islam holds back scientific knowledge, just as previous versions of Christianity did before the Reformation. Now, when the Islamic and the woke communities freaked out about this comment, he replied, and I quote, a statement of simple fact is not bigotry, and science by Muslims was great in the distant past. Muslims did great things in the Middle Ages. Now, Michael, he was going on to point out that, you know, as you said, he's retired, so the pitchfork-wielding pitchfork mob, uh, work mob can't really do anything to him except take away his prizes that he doesn't really care about. But is our culture, and indeed truth, going to survive if the only people who are prepared and able to fight for it are retired intellectual giants like him and, and like J.K. Rowling who have enough money to do so? I think this trend has been happening for some time. If you recall, Malcolm Fraser was very similar. Not until he retired did he start speaking out and changing his tune on numerous things. And we've seen auditors, generals and, and others do the same thing after retirement, uh, judges too. I think it speaks to the problems that we're now facing where we're not allowed to debate such things. And look, um, uh, the, the statement by Dawkins about uh, Islam, uh, it's not really Islam, but 
Islamic cultures, if, if, if you will. If we go back to the, the Middle Ages, I mean, the, the Western tradition was sort of kept alive by uh, Muslim scholars back in the day. You know, there, there are all sorts of things that we can draw on, which are facts that we can say that, you know, uh, th th this is an important contribution. But at the same time, it is true that if we look to, you know, uh, I mean, the fact that we saw drones over Jerusalem from a, a Muslim country, uh, I mean, to me, that just beggared belief. I, I couldn't believe I was actually seeing those images that that in this day and age, that that's, you know, how world affairs is, what it's been reduced to. I would have expected that there would have been more sort of forgiving toward this holy centre for the three Abrahamic religions. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I really think um, it is a problem. It's an indication that liberal democracy is, is faltering. And, of course, we need to keep speaking up and we need to keep debating these things. And I think eventually, I, I really get the... I really feel like it's starting to turn. Uh, it's just so many people who contact me and say, you know, they're really pleased about what I'm saying and to keep saying these things, to keep fighting the good fight. Uh, and, and I think that's really key because if we do give up, we, uh, you know, in a liberal democracy, our freedoms, our liberties, we have to actualise them. It, they don't just exist. We have to actualise them. We have to use them and we use them or lose them. I just want to finish uh, the Dawkins topic with a quote from him. He said, there's a kind of Puritan revulsion against even discussing certain things and you can essentially be cancelled just for inviting discussion of something. And, uh, you know, I think that's a, a true statement right now where you, you don't want to actually talk about anything in case you offend someone by opening the conversation. But, Michael, let's finish with a comment about the Met Police. Over the last year or so, the Met Police have lurched from PR catastrophe to PR apocalypse. And the only reason they've apologised for any of this mess and their behaviour is the sheer weight of social media outrage. And it's not as if they're realising their mistakes and having an in-house, you know, come to Jesus moment where they go, sorry, we'll, we'll do better. They have to be told to do better. And the latest calamity was when a police officer essentially accused a man of breaching the peace for walking around looking openly Jewish. And yes, instead of arresting the Palestinians and the Hamas supporters who are aggressively uh, approaching members of the public, the Met went and harassed a Jewish Brit. Now, how does the Met, the Met get out of this mess, Michael? Do they, is there a way out or has the police force got a fundamental problem within its ranks right now? Look, I'm sympathetic toward our police forces because they're part of the executive arm of government and their role is to administer the law. They can't make law, they have to administer what the law is. And if we look at the way that police officers have been treated when they're doing what a, a, a normal independent spectator would suggest was the right thing, uh, they've been hauled over the coals for it. Sometimes they've been sacked for, for doing what we would expect them to do. I think the real problem is our political leaders need to step up. They are the legislators. They make the laws that our police administer, including the, the Met Police. Um, and I think this is a problem throughout the, the Anglo West in particular. The police is sort of overrun. Um, in, in that particular case, the officer, I, I would suggest, was trying to get the person not to do something that was clearly silly. It was a political statement. It wasn't perhaps necessary. Uh, I'm not suggesting it's right. Um, I think people should be able to exercise their rights in that way. Uh, having said that, um, it, it seems a bit sort of unnecessary. And it's really interesting too that we saw that devastation in in uh, Waverley recently, 51 police cars were damaged in a riot, which meant that the police couldn't respond to other situations. I mean, the, the, the legislation, the legislators, the politicians need to take responsibility for this. They need to make laws that uh, enable the police to do their job effectively. And we need to send a clear message to people that it's completely unacceptable that our police resources are damaged in this way. And, you know, the thing with the Met is it's uh, coming up to its 200th anniversary. The Met is the original police force. Uh, without the police force, I don't think we could have the civil society that we enjoy. Uh, but again, I think it really comes back to the legislature legislators and I think uh, it's like I said I'm sympathetic toward the police I think we probably need to give them a bit of a break it's not necessarily their fault but they need the powers to to exercise uh, um, what we would expect of them and that comes from our political leaders. I think I'd be more sympathetic toward the police if they actually staged protests, a protest against the politicians and what they're being asked to enforce. But by and large, they say nothing and they just enforce it. So that would be where my sympathy runs quite short, especially in COVID, where they seem to enjoy policing people in the streets for things that should not be crime. So that's one of my beefs with them, but I appreciate your point. And look, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spectator TV, Michael. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me again.